the Old Testament talks lots and lots about evil and sin, but I'm not clear that it it really lines up elsewhere in in the Old Testament with Adam and Eve. It's actually quite remarkable how little Adam and Eve is actually mentioned in the Old Testament outside of Genesis. You know, if it was so if it was so foundational, one might think that this would play a, a bigger um, role. There's the knowledge of evil embedded, as it were, in the fruit of the tree, as the story tells it. Only its ingestion makes it possible then for the humans to have that knowledge of good and evil. Their eyes are opened. And then they know what good and evil looks like. Hey everyone, this is What Your Pastor and Tell You. Today I am on with Dr. Mark Smith. We're going to be talking about his book on Genesis and sin and evil. Oh snap, there it is right there. And uh, he's got a lot of interesting stuff to say, a lot of views that a lot of people probably haven't heard of. So this will be awesome. How are you doing today, Dr. Smith? Very well. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. It's a pleasure. So we, um, you know, we got a lot to talk about here. Uh, let's first talk about your background. Uh, just can you give people a general background, people, if, if they're not familiar with your work? I teach at Princeton Theological Seminary. I'm a professor of Old Testament um, literature and exegesis. I've been there for seven years. Before that, I was 16 years at New York University in the Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies and a bunch of places before that. Um, I am Roman Catholic. At the same time, I have a, uh, I would say I've had over the decades a substantial engagement with um, Christian denominations of uh, tremendous variety, including evangelicals. I was a founding member of the uh, Christian Fellowship at Johns Hopkins University, the only Catholic involved in that process. And of course, we have a lot of evangelicals at Princeton Seminary, as well as uh, folks from all kinds of other um, backgrounds and denominations. So um, I, I'd like to think of my thinking and working in a fairly broad uh, often Christian idiom. At the same time, I would say that the results of the scholarship that um, many, most biblical scholars in the United States aspire to or it would be results that could be accepted by scholars and other religious traditions, including Jewish biblical scholars who are, in fact, we have tremendous Jewish biblical scholars in the United States and in Israel. And I want my stuff to be able to, to stack up uh, accordingly. It doesn't stop me from commenting as a Catholic or as a Christian from time to time as I'm looking at some of this stuff, and they'll recognize that and understand that. But I think that the basic results uh, should be results that will stand up to scrutiny, not just from you know believing Christians who who mm -hmm. might have issues over some interpretations because they don't line up with doctrine, but also. The other side of matters, which is that it should it should also measure up to um, what biblical scholars across the religious and intellectual spectrum um, would be willing to entertain based on evidence. It's a very evidence driven approach, um, and in fact, that's what really got me into this project. Very cool. Yeah, I, I like that approach a lot. Okay, so. And your book, can you give us just a general overview of what you talked about it, what you, what the purpose of the book was? Um, sure. Anything I, you want to add there? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to do that. So one of the things that has bothered me for a long time and has been pointed out by a number of biblical scholars is that on the one hand, Genesis 3 is taken by... Christian denominations, by the way, not really by Jewish tradition so much, and I'll come back to that later, as an account of the fall of Adam and Eve from grace. And in, in my tradition, this is the origin of original sin, you know, very robust discussion of original sin in many Christian authors, including Augustine. Um, and I've had some difficulty with that assumption about that way of reading the story because 
the story entirely lacks the vocabulary of sin, transgression, hmm. disobedience, etc. And we know the Bible knows how to talk about sin and disobedience and so on. But this chapter does not have a single term in it for that kind of language of transgression or mm -hmm. sin. And I find that I find that very suggestive that maybe that's not exactly what the emphasis of the story is. I'm not saying that there isn't something problematic going on there. Mm -hmm. And I would say, and I do say in the book, I, I talk about uh, Genesis 3, not so much as the story of the fall, but as the subtitle says, the fallout and original sin in the Bible. That is, the, there's a fallout from what Adam and Eve do, uh, but it's, it's, it's a fallout that takes a few chapters to develop. The word for sin does not first appear in the Bible until chapter 4. This is in God's warning to, to Cain that uh, sin, sin lurks at the opening, that is the opening of this domicile. Um, and, um, and, and so it's, it's not really clear to me that Genesis 3 itself narrates a fall, but I would sort of trace Cain and Abel as kind of a fallout in the next generation from what they do. And that is, becomes more fully manifest from a more universal perspective at the beginning of the flood story in chapter six of Genesis. Um, so I call it fallout and not the fall. And I, I, for me, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect my faith very much. I mean, I know people won't like this idea because they, they, I mean, we're very fixed on this notion that Genesis three gives us the whole story, but whether I locate that at chapter three or culminating in chapter six, for, I don't think it matters that much for me. I, I know that humanity, um, you know, has a, a deeply flawed character to it. And I, I can know that from reading Genesis 3 through 6. Um, and uh, I don't need it simply based on um, the traditional reading of chapter 3. But I know people will not agree with this. Yeah, sure. Everyone's got their view on this. Right. So, um, a little more on that. So, you know, the the big deal for a lot of people is, okay, this is the first sin. And there's a lot of different ways to define this word sin. Um, you know, it's whether it's just disobeying God's law or, you know, some people equate it with evil. How would you define sin? And do you think this is the first sin? No, I don't think it's the first sin. I think that they would label it with some sort of terminology that is traditional in the Hebrew Bible. They've got lots of words for sin and transgression in biblical Hebrew. There's no lack of a storytelling when they think it's really about sin or transgression. And this story does not do that. And I think that that's a big problem for those who think that this is a story about sin. I, the, the, you use the term disobey God's law. What God says, he doesn't say because you, you didn't listen to my voice. He says, because you listened to the voice of your wife. And I don't think it's any sin to listen to the voice of your wife. Um, so, I find it deeply problematic to to assume that this is really a story about sin. It's it's a story. There is it's it's it's. I mean, let let me put it a little bit differently. I don't think they even know what sin is until their eyes are opened. Hmm. I think that they once 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 they their eyes are open and they know what they did, they're almost they're almost like. Um, they're almost like kids who, and by the way, they, they actually use this expression, uh, the knowledge of good and evil is actually used in, elsewhere in the Bible um, in a couple of ways. And one of it is for when children come of age. Um, and there's some, there is something a bit like that going on in the story, perhaps. Um, it strikes me that... Um, um, that they don't they don't know what the, their problem is 
until their eyes are open, which means they couldn't have known before they ate of the fruit. Uh, it, it, a little bit like I have a friend who says, it's like telling your two-year-old, don't touch the stove. And the kid touches the stove because you, you know, it's an attractive nuisance, as you might call it legally. Um, but the kid that's 10 years old, you say, I'm cooking something in the oven. They can understand that. Don't touch the stove. And they say, okay, I won't because I don't want to get burned. They can understand that. But I think um, I've had I have three children. They're a little older than that now. Um, but it, you know, kids are curious by definition, and as well as they should be. Um, I think the story, what the story gives us about humanity, is that before there's sin, there's desire. They use the language of desire when Eve looks at the tree, and she's she's sizing it up. And they use terminology of, de of desire. And that one of the things that I think the story does is explores human psychology, suggesting that desire is something primordial to humans, even before good versus evil. That children have desire even before they have the knowledge of good and evil. And I think that, I think that the story is very powerful for laying that all out for people. We don't know how they came to have desire. The story doesn't tell us that. There are many things the story doesn't tell us. And it, and, and you know, if, if uh, there, it just doesn't answer the kinds of questions that many people have um, uh, about the story or about humanity. It can't, why place a, such a tree in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve? Why would God do such a thing? But that's not, I don't know that that's the, the interest of the storyteller. Hmm. This interest of the storyteller is, is to probe these things about Adam and Eve and relationship with God and, and to sort of get the ball rolling on the story of the fallout uh, beginning in Genesis 3 and moving forward through 4 and 6. You can't have a Cain and Abel story mm -hmm. and, unless you have an Adam and Eve story in the garden not going quite right. So there is something, there is something... I would say problematic being presented to us um, in Genesis three, and I think it's I think in a way each part of the story, even of the 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 Adam and Eve story, the Cain and Abel story, even to some extent the flood, it presents all kinds of mysteries about God, and that this is to some extent also about humanity. The mystery in chapter three has to do with why would God set this up the way that God sets it up this way? Why do any of this? Why have such a tree that's that's of this sort? And people, some people blame God in the story. I don't do, I wouldn't do that, but I, I've read a number of critics who do that, not my style. I don't think that the ancient authors thought that blaming God was what the story was about. Um, the mystery, the mystery in the Cain and Abel story is why doesn't God just accept both their offerings? No big deal. But in a way, what we're dramat dramatizing is not, not uh, I actually have an answer to that question um, about why God does not prefer Cain's sacrifice to Abel's. But, um, but I think, again, it has to do with, we have a story that sort of dramatizes the development of humanity. And that's really what Genesis 1 to 11 is all about as a whole is sort of explaining how did we get to the world of Abraham from the beginning? And it tells a story, it, it, it sort of lays out all the dots in the story, but it doesn't explain everything the way that modern people want good, rational or faith-based explanations of this. It doesn't supply a lot of those details. And that's because they're trying to tell an interesting story and engaging story for their ancient audiences, not because they're trying to please our theological needs mm -hmm. or desires. Um, the story can still satisfy some of those needs and desires, but that's not its chief aim. God gave the, the Bible first to ancient Israel, not to us. And so some of our subsequent post-biblical questions, theological problems and questions, which were not theirs, often doesn't really address some of those things.
even mm. as we search and search the pages of the scriptures. Hmm. Okay, so um, maybe you might have mentioned it, but um, what about the topic of evil? I mean, you don't think Genesis has... Does, I mean, surely surely some evil is mentioned, but you well, don't think Genesis has yeah, well, the, it, the evil that's mentioned is the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. And it, it's only the knowledge of good and evil that's in Genesis 3. There's no evil act. There's no evil in general. The snake is not called evil, but cunning. I like the translation cunning for the serpent because cunning can, can evoke something that's both positive and negative, depending on the context in which it's used. It's a little ambiguous, and I think the term is meant to be a little ambiguous for us. Um, I noticed the Greek translates it sagacious, which the word for sage, uh, the adjective, and it, it's that sounds rather positive to me. I think it's more positive a translation than something like cunning. Um, so it's 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 there, there's there's so there there's evil in the sense that God God has created. I I guess what one would say is eventually the potential for evil. In other words. There's evil, there's the knowledge of evil embedded, as it were, in the fruit of the tree. And only, as the story tells it, only its ingestion makes it possible then for the humans to have that knowledge of good and evil. Their eyes are opened, and then they know what good and evil looks like. And then the story doesn't pursue it, but it assumes that that knowledge transmits uh, to Cain and Abel, and certainly to Cain. And it's an implicit assumption of the story that that knowledge carries forward and, it carry, and it's the implicit assumption, well, I think even manifestation in the Cain and Abel story is that they're able, no pun intended, to act on it. Um, and that's Cain's act of murdering his brother is clearly an evil act and evil um, well, sin is the word that they use in that chapter about the burden that he's carrying. Um, and I don't think that anybody would suggest that murdering your brother is not an evil act, even though they don't use, the, I don't think they use the language there, but murder is pretty bad stuff. Um, so they know that they know then that the knowledge of good and evil in, as an implicit working out of the story, I think, in Cain and Abel's story, they know that it carries forward generationally and forward to the flood story where the, the working assumption is that basically humanity generally has the capacity, not only has the knowledge of good and evil, but the capacity to act on it. Hmm. Um, the mystery for me, actually, um, in, in a lot of this whole process is how is it that anyone was able to be good? That is, if everyone, if everyone has the capacity for good and evil, mm -hmm. and they start, and, and everybody is so bad, according to the, the traditional telling of the story of the fall, if you work with the traditional paradigm of the story of the fall, then in theory, nobody should be able to do any good. There's no capacity there. I know people talk about special grace that God gives, et cetera. Story doesn't talk about that. That's kind of a way of getting out of the conundrum that in fact, there's no reason why Abel should be good or that Enoch should be good or that mm. sh Noah should be good, but they're all good. And I don't think our storyteller has any problem with them being good, but it does rub up against the assumption that the fall is so total that it affects everyone completely. Clearly people are still able to make, choose the good. They're not so marred by original sin or whatever that that's not uh, possible. But I've always found that to be sort of a theological conundrum that is um, um, created by the assumption of a strong reading of the fall in Genesis three. What is the traditional Christian view of that? Augustine, read Augustine. I mean, boy, that Augustine. Augustine has a long list. I read Augustine on this in my Genesis class from um, 
from the city of God. And Augustine has um, all kinds of, he's picked up some notes from the New Testament. What went before the action? That there has to be an attitude or will before there's an action. So that Augustine assumes that there was an evil will in Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit, because otherwise they couldn't choose it. But the story doesn't say anything about an evil will. So hmm. we keep importing ideas, theological ideas, ideas about people that are not really part of the language of the storyteller in the actual text. So, you know, people, I know people don't, don't like this sort of interpretation or, or way of interpreting Genesis 3, mm -hmm. but if you're going to hew closely to the text, I often have students who say, I only interpret it based on what the text says. Good. Then don't tell me about sin and evil in Genesis 3 then, because it's not there. Mm -hmm. So this, this is, this is, I think a, I think this is a, a difficulty for Bible believing Christians because we have a very strong view of the fall, but we depend on ideas about it that the text does not really speak to at all. And I have to admit, I have to admit, I, I find that to be a terrible conundrum of faith because it seems to me if you're truly a Bible believing Christian and you start and you really say, I'm only believing what the what the Bible says, then in, and then you you believe about sin and evil in the story st strikes me as as biblically idolatrous that you're making the Bible say something that it doesn't say. You're making God say in God's word something that it doesn't say, and I find that deeply problematic. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So. Um... Mary, I, I interviewed your one of your old students, Dr. Miriam Brand, on the topic. She's and, great. Yeah, really fun talking to her for sure. Yeah, she's terrific. <laughs> and uh, I got a lot of backlash actually uh, from people in the comments, and the reason is because you know when you talk about okay, when was the first sin? Well, Paul says right there, you know, Romans five twelve. Sure. Um, well, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go out of order. Um, but at the same time, um, that's that's what everyone's thinking about right now. Okay, so let me as, address that. As a Christian, how do you address yeah. that? Yeah, so I, I appreciate the question. I think it's a good question. I think it's an important question for Christians. Mm -hmm. um, this is how I think about it. I can learn about I can learn about um, the sin of Adam from the New Testament, from Romans and elsewhere. And I don't have any problem with that. That's my understanding of Romans. It does so two points. The first is I don't actually have to accept though that the reading of Romans is necessarily an excellent reading of Genesis three. Hmm. And now I, again, people won't like that. Um, what I think about is I think that Christians have to read the Bible or should read the Bible or think about reading the Bible with what I would say double lenses, bifocals. I have one set of focals for the for the Old Testament text itself without reading everything else into it from elsewhere in the Bible, even from within the Old Testament. That is, I first want to read the text itself before I expand my reading elsewhere. And my other, my other set of, the other part of my bifocals is my reading as a Christian and using the New Testament. And I can still see the same landscape, you might say, through these bifocals. And I want to give integrity to the reading of the Old Testament text itself, and I want to give integrity to the New Testament reading of the same text. Hmm. And I don't have to feel I I don't I, I don't have to necessarily harmonize the two completely. I have to sort of work with tandem with both of them. But what I think is going on here, which I don't have a problem with this, which is what I call retrospective reading. Hmm. That is, okay. that is, every 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 text assumes a body of literature in its context, and that that body of literature changes over time. 
so that the author of Genesis 3 was not working with the same body of texts as the author of Romans is working with. The tradition that Romans knows, and it knows it not just from the Old Testament, but from other Jewish literature of the period, not just from the Christian tradition, but knows other works. Some of these are, I mean, the, the book of Enoch is cited in the New Testament or mentioned in the New Testament, and even though it never made it into the Bible per se. So we know, we know that the New Testament writers have, are, are drawing on for some of, their, some of their ideas, some of their wording, some of their thinking from the tradition, from the interpretive tradition that they've received because of these other additional works. They know all of the Old Testament, but the author of Genesis 3 does not know all of the Old Testament. The authors of the New Testament know intertestamental Jewish literature. I mean, intertestamental is not a great term, but the literature of Jewish religious literature from the, from the second century BC or BCE down through the New Testament, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm -hmm. um, much of that, many of the sort of the language, the ideas, the worldview that they have in the New Testament partakes of this larger Jewish worldview of the Second Temple, the sometimes called Second Temple period, not just from the Old Testament. So they're working with a wider repertoire of texts, and they read, they read their biblical texts, like Genesis 3, through the lens of those other texts and traditions, which the author of Genesis 3 could not do because he had no access or she had no right. access to any of those things. So the New Testament, therefore, engages in what I call retrospective reading. And everybody and everybody who does their work engages to some degree in retrospective reading. It's very hard to avoid. We read with what we know. Right. That's what we do. I, Christian traditions read Genesis 3 with the ideas of Augustine. Well, Augustine used all kinds of things, hmm. even more than what the New Testament writers did. He has all kinds of notions of the will that's really derived from Greek philosophy. Authors in the New Testament, there's some language of will, certainly, but for Augustine, it's much more developed. So every generation is working with a further level of retrospective reading. It differs. And for me to be a good reader or scholarly reader of Genesis 3 mm -hmm. is to be able to sift through the differences between what Genesis 3 seems to be expressing, what the New Testament expresses about it, what Augustine expresses about the New Testament reading of the Genesis 3 passage, mm -hmm. and so on from there, including in church doctrine and the doctrine of original sin, at least in my church tradition, which is not, it's certainly shared by many other traditions. So it just strikes me that um, it's complicated. I don't have any problem accepting, you know, the, the um, divine inspiration of Romans as well as Genesis 3. I don't, I'm not, I'm not somehow trying to deny what, what Romans is, um, is, is claiming. I would say that its reading is based on a full reading of Genesis 3 through 6 and the fallout that's involved, and then reading it back into chapter 3. That's my take. Hmm. So would you say, um, yes or no, would you say they contradict? No, they, they, but they don't, they don't mesh readily. It's more complicated or nuanced than that. Hmm. And I know people, people, they like their stuff straightforward and you're hearing you're hearing this this sort of waffling by some professor type but i'm i'm just trying to read the text as it is not the text as i wish it were right so of course you know we're i mean i don't know how you'd call it um and i've heard some people use to use the term you know historical critical approach we're trying to figure out what the original writer was thinking and you know yeah. Maybe you wouldn't you wouldn't say that when we look at Genesis three, we're not trying to do that or okay. you specifically. All right. So historical critics, uh, first of all, there's a lot of variation among historical critics and what they do. Uh -huh. 
I would, I, and, and there's kind of an idea about what historical criticism is doing, but even historical mm. criticism is a moving target in terms of what historical critics have been doing for a hundred plus years. <laughs> it's not just one thing. Uh -huh. And I think what happens is they get pigeonholed um, by people who are not very conversant with the actual, you know, I mean, they, they, they read some biblical scholarship, you know, mm -hmm. You know, maybe they've read, for example, three or four books about source criticism, but there's a hundred books written on source criticism and people <laughs> have different views of this stuff. Um, and, and many people don't even subscribe. Half the scholarship today doesn't even subscribe to the source theory anymore. They have other kinds of critical um, readings of the biblical text. So it's a, it's a very complicated scholarly landscape. A few comments. First of all, I don't think we can get into the mind of biblical writers. I don't think we can get into the mind of, of Eisenhower and figure out what he was thinking. And we've got a lot more doc documentation for Eisenhower than we do for the biblical texts. So I, I think that trying to, I, I, what I would say is my emphasis has been on trying to stay as close as I can to the text. I, I try to base what I suppose about the text on the text, not on what I think the author might be thinking. Okay. Or, and, and so I, I, I think a lot of people who do historical criticism mm -hmm. have gotten away from the idea of original intention, trying to figure out the original intention of the story or okay. of the author. Um, the other thing, the other thing that historical critics are famous for, and I do think in some pl places it remains a very important task to attempt. Mm -hmm. I'll get to it in a minute, but I'm but as a historical critic, I wouldn't say it's the most important thing that historical critics do. The most important thing that historical critics do is they pay attention as much as possible to the language of the text. Historical critics are often, they're often sort of painted as people who, who are sort of making up historical backgrounds for the stories and then, and then doubting their historical authenticity, that kind of thing. Um, I think the most important thing that historical critics know is they, they, they really know the language. They know when the language is priestly looking or when it looks like something inspired by another book like Deuteronomy or from some other kind of language. They know, they, they study not just how many times a word occurs, anybody can do that, but they're also looking at how the same phrases elsewhere might give some kind of insight into what's going on with the same phrases in a given text. So it's, it's really levering knowledge of language and ancient imagery and seeing where that imagery is in similar stories that give you an insight into what the whole story is adding up to. It's not so much about, about it's not in the first moment about positing sources or redactional theories. It's not in the first moment about supposing a particular background for the story against which then I have to read the story almost as if it's a kind of an allegory for that situation. I mean, I've, 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 I've made those kinds of comments in my book, but that's not the first job of a commentator. And it's not the first thing I do in the book. The first thing I do in the book really, I think is to pay attention to the language of the text mm. and the motifs as we find them and how is it working? That is a kind of literary study, close literary and language study of the text itself. Mm trying to look at where these motifs appear elsewhere in the Bible to get a sort of a sense of what's going on in the cultural world that, that the story seems to be located in, to appreciate then, to give a little depth dimension to the story, not just sort of reading it flatly in an isolation, mm -hmm. but to give it. A so obviously you, you, I think you kind of hinted at, you know, a certain view of inspiration. I mean, I would assume you think the Bible is inspired. Um, is that a yes in some kind of way it's inspired? Yeah, you know, it's, okay. it, it's a yes. Uh, okay. uh, I, I think that inspiration is um, 
my sense of inspiration is more complicated than um, what is, I guess, sort of a traditional way of thinking about it, but I don't mm-hmm. think it's any less important. Hmm. Okay. I can explain and that if you want me to. We, I'll ask another question and you probably will answer it for me. Okay. So, um, so, you know, the, the issue with a lot of people is like, okay, so Genesis three is, you know, kind of like a historical event that happened, you know, whenever, and there's different views on that, of course. And then you have, you know, something like Romans five comes along and, you know, most people see that as like a, that's also describing a historical event through divine inspiration or like some divinely inspired tradition that got to, to Paul or whatever. Sure. Um, but as you said, you know, Romans five is kind of taking a different tra- additional text that you know, Paul isn't specifically looking at Genesis three, you know, it's, it has additional text that it's pulling from to come to uh, Paul's conclusion there. So how do you fit that in with inspiration without saying that, you know, Paul's wrong? Oh, I don't have a problem. Let's look at the text. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin. And so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, that is before Moses. But sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. Okay, so they, one must be very careful, even in reading Romans uh, 5, 12. It doesn't say, actually, it does refer to the transgression of Adam. It's interesting that they don't call it the sin of Adam. That is, sin came into the world through one man. I don't have any problem with that. It was, I, I've already laid out how I think there's a fallout from Genesis 3 to Genesis mm. 4 to Genesis 6. And death certainly came through sin. I don't have any argument with there. And so death spread to all because all have sinned. Now, it's mm. interesting. Um, it, it's interesting. This sentence is is meant to sort of reflect the general sense of humanity that you get from Genesis. It doesn't speak to particular cases like an Enoch. That is, did Enoch die? Great question. Inquiring minds want to know. But this is an effort to generalize about the human condition, not to worry about the specifics of a figure like Enoch. Hmm. But what it's saying is sin came into the world through one man. Okay, that's right. The first step was eating of the fruit of the of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then death and then came able in effect act on that came acts on that and death came through sin um okay i don't think i have a problem with that i i just i i just i might not read it so strongly to assume that this all was a definitively achieved by the end of the story in Genesis 3, which is, I think, how everybody else reads it. But mm. that's not what the text even here says. Mm. Well, that's well, really that, fascinating. I, that's okay. I mean, it does say they do call it the transgression of Adam. So they they clearly understand this as being... And that I, 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 would, I would just hold... I would just simply hold up that Adam's transgression, so to speak, is what he makes possible in the world by having eaten of the fruit, of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, and not because I think that the story tells us that he himself sinned. But it's, it's, that's my way of thinking about it is, gonna, is not going to be um, as tight as, I mean, people can argue and claim rightly that, that uh, I think Romans 5.12, when it calls it the transgression of Adam, they really do mean transgression. Um, but in general, I, I probably, I, I, I think there's enough overlap between what I think about Genesis 3 to 6 and what Romans 5, 12 and 13 at least say. Uh, it's not only when you get into verse 14b, the second half of 14, where it's going to rub up pretty hard against what I'm saying. But I don't feel strong. It doesn't bother me if people don't read um, these texts the way that I do. I mean... I'm okay with that. Um, I think I think people will continue to read this as Genesis three as the fall, and they're going to read 
Romans 5.12 as supporting that, but I, I have to admit, I don't really think that's quite what it says, but it's okay. Right. Well, of course, um, I think the, the big thing people are wanting to hear is like the best way to look at this and fit that in with inspiration. So, well, I think bifocals yeah. is the best way I can describe it. We gotcha. get to, right. that is, I, I do, I will say this. I think that the Bible, I, I, one way you ask how to look at this, I think on many things, the Bible often actually does not quite agree. Um, and there, there, we, we can we can ask um, all kinds of questions about how did God make the world? He make it good? Yeah, that's what Genesis one says. Proverbs says he made it with wisdom. Well, you say good and wisdom, they're pretty close, but no one, you know, people people have no problem harmonizing everything first. Is it the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain in the New Testament? Do I, am I very concerned about that? No, but people who have to have to harmonize those two are not reading the scriptures faithfully because they're trying to make one into the other or they ignore the difference. So I should be unhappy with them that they're not reading the scriptures faithfully when they either ignore the problem or they try to harmonize the problem. If God wanted the, the two to be the same, God would have written it the same, but God did not write it the same. And that's the way it is. I'm just trying to read it the way we have both. So I, I don't think that a diversity of perspective on even the same event, and I gave you the example of creation being created with good and with mm -hmm. wisdom. Um, it's also created through conflict. I mean, in Psalm 74, verses 12 to 17, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways in which creation is told in the Old Testament. And the Bible has a kaleidoscopic view or a series of different views, and they allow those differences to stand because the whole idea is to learn different things from different understandings embedded in God's word, not to just try to harmonize it and make it one simple thing and then build my doctrine out of that, which is, I think, what people have done with the story of the fall. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I, th I think that taking proper account into, uh, in, into our minds and our hearts allows us to be taught different things, even when the Bible is talking about the same event. So I don't, and I, what I would say is that the one, at least of the lessons about Genesis three, that Romans isn't really teaching. It's teaching us something else about the, about, you know, Adam and Christ and as, as a kind of, um, um, a foils for one another type and anti-type, mm -hmm. um, what Genesis 3 is about is teaching about the potential, the potential for human desire and curiosity, because the language of desire is used in the text, and it teaches us about humanity and what, it, what its curiosity or its, its desire can lead to. And that's, that's at least some of the things that the text does talk about as opposed to assuming a strong view of sin and transgression and so on. So I think that both Romans 5 and Genesis 3 teach important things, biblically inspired things that Christians ought to really want to know, but it's not necessarily the same thing. Hmm. I, th I think I have an idea of what you, you want to say to this, but when when we're talking about um you know the the big rub okay the big rub is like the historicity question okay you know if there's two texts that contradict then and they're both historical then you know logically that can't make sense um do Why? You, depends uh, on what the purpose of the text is you or are you saying or are you saying anything that gets narrated 
as if it's located in historical time, if it doesn't say the same thing. So what do you do? Did Jesus give the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain? You answer that question for me. <laughs> well, I certainly am no New Testament scholar. I would assume that um, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways. Oh, t two different sermons. No, I don't know. Sure, um, it was a repeat engagement. They loved it so much the first right. time Jesus gave it a second time. Why not? <laughs> Why well, not? I I have no issue with saying that, you know, um, the writers of the New Testament were, um, you know, not bending the truth or whatever, but making a theological point rather than a historical point. Um, uh, but um, is that is that the route you would go? I, 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 I don't think that the, first of all, if the author doesn't know the other author's work, then it's no contradiction to them in the first place, just to make a point. It becomes a contradiction when we read both of those together, mm -hmm. right? So this is not a problem of what the author is doing or thinking or whatever. Um, I, I, I think you can get into some serious differences. I have to think of some examples. I, I don't really sit down and think about this very much. <laughs> but in historical books yeah. where the same event is basically narrated more than once and it 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 doesn't play exactly it doesn't play out exactly uh -huh. the very same way and this is again for me like the sermon on the mount versus the sermon on the plain now i will say that any most bible believing christians for whom there can be no contradiction in the Bible, will always be able to figure out a way to harmonize it. Because that's what the tradition has always done, or it's done, well, I don't know about always, but it's certainly done it for a long time. Mm. And I, I, have, I have no lack of confidence in the ability of evangelicals to reconcile <laughs> any problem that's in that's in the scriptures. Sure. Oh, so it doesn't really matter what I say because no matter what I say, it isn't really going to convince um, people who've already decided that that is the way that it is, and there's no point in thinking about it otherwise. Mm. So, but I I do think that what gets lost when people do that is that I think that what is to be learned from God's word is sometimes it, it you know in 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 a passage in a difference of detail is to learn something about god or humanity or the world that god presumably wants readers faithful readers to know because it's that difference in that text as opposed mm -hmm. to something else going on because you know just as god's creating um, you know, both with wisdom and with goodness, um, or to take a different example, according to Isaiah, God created both the light and the darkness. Genesis 1, doesn't, the darkness is already there. There's no mention of God creating the darkness. So there's, there's, a, there's, um, there's a lot of differences. Uh, in, in the accounts of things in scriptures. And the question is, what are we supposed to learn from some of those different reckonings? That truth, truth, uh, we, we operate on such a model of truth that there can only be one truth. I don't really think in the ancient world, that's how it worked with all, with all due respect to, um, you know, good, faithful, biblical readers whom I really do um, respect and appreciate, especially at, at my school. Um, but I think truth was considered kaleidoscopic. It was entered into from multiple uh, angles and that there's something about the mystery of God in that, which um, is very profound for me. Yeah, for sure. Okay, looks like I'm back. Cool. All right. Um, so I would just want to ask you just maybe just go over um, a little bit more about the rest of the book here um, before we close off. 
the specifically, you know, you have the Old Testament, and then you have, I mean, you know, whatever is the New Testament, and then you have the intertestamental period. Um, could you just give us a really quick survey, maybe specifically the Old Testament? I mean, there there are a couple references to maybe talking about you know the evil sin. You don't think that those are are the views there of um, you don't think the Old Testament really talks about that, do you? No, no, the t Old Testament talks lots and lots about evil and sin, okay. but I'm not clear that it it really lines up elsewhere in in the Old Testament with Adam and Eve. It's actually quite remarkable how little Adam and Eve is actually mentioned in the Old Testament outside of Genesis. Um, you know, if it was so, if it was so foundational, one might think that this would play a, a bigger um, role. But I, it doesn't mean I don't take it seriously, et cetera. But I've just always found that quite striking. Hmm. Uh, they I know. They know yeah. people are. I mean, Old Testament. They know people are evil. Hmm. There's no, and that they sin. But they don't need the Adam and Eve story to tell them that. They just can see it right with their own eyes. Hmm. Um, so, so I know you in your book you talk about Ezekiel twenty-eight, and you actually think that Genesis, you know, three is written after Ezekiel twenty-eight. Um, and Ezekiel twenty-eight is almost, in your opinion, like a, a different narrative apart from the the Adam and Eve narrative. Is that a good way to put it? I, I, I think that they share a lot of motifs. Um, I think that they share some similar, um, a kind of a, maybe even what might, one might call a, a template. Um, and um, I'm turning to, let's see, you mentioned Isaiah 14. Uh, yeah, there's also. Yeah, so, it's, so the first thing is that the fall in Isaiah 14 is actually a different fall story. And that's the fall not of humans, in, according to this, but it's the fall from heaven, as it says explicitly in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Mm. How you have fallen from heaven, mm. O shining one, the son of dawn. Now, this, this is actually sounds like a, um, a divinity. Uh, we know of divinities of dawn and dusk outside of the Bible, and that's what this seems to be an allusion to. And what's going to happen is this is going to become, this is, this is going to later play out as the backstory to the fall in Genesis 3 is the fall of angels from heaven which is of course not anything that is in Genesis 3 or in Genesis at all, except there's a, they, they do try to, there is a kind of a parallel perhaps, which is not placed at the time of Genesis 3, but is placed at the time of the flood or, or before the flood. And that's in Genesis 6, 1 to 4. And Genesis 6, 1 to 4 is about the fall, yeah. the so-called Nephilim. And the Nephilim are fallen from heaven, so to speak. And I think that that little, it's a tiny little piece. It doesn't really, it, it sounded like a script that people knew, but they, but it, for whatever reason, the author of Genesis mm -hmm. 6, 1 to 4 doesn't include the whole story. It, it gives you the brief, almost a handful of details about it as if they knew what that story was supposed to sound like, and they got it. It seems to be somewhat parallel to this Isaiah 14, verse 12. Mm -hmm. And um, we could go on and, and read the rest of it, but this is not, this is, this is within the, within the text, it's talking about actually a fallen God. Later on, the fallen god is going to become a fallen angel because once you, once you go through the monotheistic lens or wash that the Old Testament is assumed to be, no one's going to think about it as a fallen god anymore. They become angels. Everybody thinks, um, you know, that that's what the background is. We have the we have the the type story we might call it of the fall from heaven. It actually predates the Bible. We have remnants of it in, in extra biblical literature. Hmm. 
It's, I think, reflected in the Isaiah 14 story. I think it's reflected. It's the sons of God, according to Genesis 6, who are who, who may be the Nephilim, which literally means fallen ones. Um, so this is, this is a kind of, I, I'd call it almost a kind of parallel mythic story that in later literature, in between what we might say between the Old Testament and New Testament becomes a further backstory to the fall in Genesis 3. In other words, there's a whole, this, this whole fall from heaven um, story gets played out in Jewish literature on the eve of Christianity in a very, very big way in so-called books of Enoch. The Enochs have a long um, discussion of the fall from heaven of these evil watchers, as they're called. And these are angels from heaven and that becomes a way in both in in both that time well it certainly in in christian stories they sort of realign they align up the story of the fall from heaven and the story of the fall in genesis 3 which they're not originally aligned with one another so genesis 6 1 to 4 put uses it as the backdrop to the flood story it's alternative to the so-called fall of Genesis 3. But what happens in, in Christian tradition is that we align these two so that they're, one pre, becomes part of the explanation for the other one. And the way we do that is we make the snake into the devil, and the devil is the, fall, is the fallen one from heaven, and that's the one who tempts Adam and Eve and that's how you get the the you know sin and death and the fall. So it's 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 actually quite a bit. I have to think of. I I don't know if I can think off the top of my head of the first time the fall from heaven of evil or bad angels uh, gets spoken of as the backstory uh, i suppose as soon as the devil is assumed the snake is assumed to be the devil would be probably the first place and i i i don't remember when they're first identified it's probably i'm not sure when it is but i could i could look that up pretty quickly but in any case that is also a kind of secondary move that's made in the interpretation of the story mm -hmm. uh, of course, it only pushes the, the theological problem back one stage. That is, my problem with the story is how could Adam, if God made Adam good, how could he have ever chosen? And, and, if, and if eating the fruit is an evil act, as assumed by traditional Christian reading of the text, mm -hmm. how could Adam have ever chosen to do something evil if he's made very good, which is what Genesis 1 tells us about humanity. Mm -hmm. I've always found that to be a conundrum. Well, okay, there it is. But I think what happens is that people assume they try to use the fall, or in effect, they use the fall from heaven as kind of a further backstory, and they push the, they're pushing the problem back just one stage. In other words, how could angels made good by God and Lord knows he didn't make them evil. Yeah. I mean, that's the assumption. How could perfectly good angels ever choose evil? And no one really explained that what they what people say, as they say with Genesis 3, is they had free will. But even if you have free will, if you were made perfectly good, or if you're made good, and you're very good, how do you explain why you would choose evil? Now, I'm sure people can come up with lots of answers, but the texts never tell us. Hmm. It's, it's one of these things that they have all the dots. We connect the dots. We make up things to make it make sense for us. Um, and we're off to the races. But I don't think the texts really explain these things cogently. And I don't think that that's what their concern was. Mm -hmm. Um, that's our concern, but I don't think mm -hmm. it's theirs. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, 
Yep. So maybe I wasn't clear earlier. Um, <laughs> while Isaiah 14 is a great passage, right? Um, I was actually specifically talking about Ezekiel 28. Oh, let's go to Ezekiel. Is, you know, Let me just the, open that up. Sure, go for it. Yeah. Um, of course, you know you have the supposed cherub. Although I oh, read earlier great. that. Yeah. So um, that story is even closer. I I would say the template there is the strongest comparison for um for genesis 3 and i think they they're either working off of the same template and and going in two different directions it is theoretically possible um it it is possible that the author that genesis 3 is working off of ezekiel 28 I can't prove it, but they sh they certainly know the same ba basic template. They talk about um, they they talk about uh, the cherub. They talk about uh, they mention Eden. The word Eden is used in the Garden of God in chapter twenty eight, verse thirteen. So they're referring to, in effect, the same. We might say what. Well, most Bible readers would just assume is the same story. I think they're referring to a tradition that they both know and they're playing off of it differently. And I'll, let me explain why I think that. When, Gen when, when Ezekiel 28 starts off, it talks about uh, how, so it, 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 it's, it's addressing, it's addressing the story or the story that the chapter 28 begins by saying that this is about the Prince of Tyre. Okay. Our story is not about the Prince of Tyre. Okay. Let's just, then it says, um, uh, well, I mean, there's lots of things that it says. It starts talking about how haughty and, and proud the Prince of Tyre is, et cetera. And, um, how you have grown haughty because of your wealth. So this is really talking about the historical circumstances of Tyre as an extremely wealthy seafaring power um, at the time of Ezekiel, not at the time of the creation. So they give you two different time frames. They're not, so they're not doing exactly the same thing, are they? Even though they, refer, they both reference Eden, um, et cetera. Um, it's going to go on. Um, yeah, then it's going to say, by the hand of strangers, you will die. So that's like the first part of the Oracle section running from 28, 1 to 10. And then it starts again. The word of the Lord came to me, O mortal, intone a lament over the king of Tyre and say to him, and this is really going to sound more like, a little bit more like the Genesis 3 story. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and flawless and beauty. You were in, in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your adornment. And it lists all these stones. And we're supposed to think of the garden of Eden, trees, stones, the cherub. He says, he actually says in verse 14, and the text is debated by scholars, the translation I have in front of me, which is the um, the new uh, uh, JPS Jewish Publication Society version, says I created you as a cherub, as if you were a cherub. Uh, and I'm going to open up the um, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, to Ezekiel 28, and tell you that their translation says. Um, let's see, where was it? With an anointed cherub as guardian, I placed you. So there's a textual problem there. And in fact, there's a note there. I love the NRSV. Note B, meaning of Hebrew uncertain. <laughs> and so there's, there is a uh, question there, but, um, Anyway, you were the other thing that verse 14 says, you are on the holy mountain of God. Now, Genesis 3 does not talk about a mountain, but the mountain motif is the traditional motif of God's home or abode. It's traditionally on the mountain of God. And commonly, for example, Jerusalem is called the mountain of God because that's the traditional way of talking about the divine home. Genesis 3 doesn't have anything about a mountain. 
So which one was it? If you're worried about harmonizing the two texts, you're going to drive yourself insane because the two passages have so many differences between them. I, I'm not going to worry about that too much. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. Now, you can, again, Genesis 3 doesn't say anything about iniquity being found in Adam and Eve, but we assume that from the way we read the fall. Um, and then it talks about in the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. There's no, there's no trade going on in Genesis 3. Adam is not out there trading with Mediterranean uh, powers. And so I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and the guardian, again, the mountain reference, and the guardian cherub drove you out. Actually, Genesis 3 says that God drove him out and the cherub is there to guard it. A little difference between the two. There's a lot of little differences like this. Um, the thing that does, and uh, let's see, it's got to be in here. Let's see. I cast you to the ground, which sounds like a little bit more like the fall. Uh, anyway, so basically, the king of Tyre is, they take the template of the idea of the tradition of the garden of Eden, and they apply it to the king of Tyre, and they modify it for the king of Tyre, the idea of king of Tyre, famous for trade and so on. And they've got some other differences, which are not particular to the king of Tyre, like talking about this being on the mountain, which is different from Genesis 3, because I think actually that this was a familiar tradition. It was a familiar template. The template was used in two different ways, uh, or in a series of different ways in the two texts. And they're both teaching slightly different things from God's word to us. Hmm. So specifically, why in the I'm I'm having a hard time grasping why would uh, the writer of Ezekiel be trying to describe the king of Tyre in Garden of Eden terms? Like he obviously didn't think the king of Tyre was like back in some Garden of Eden that I would. No, I don't think he really thought historically that the king of Tyre. Right. Right. So you know this idea that we have to read this thing historically like that is you know as both talking about the Garden of Eden historically. Clearly, Ezekiel 28 is not doing that. What they're doing is they're taking the, the, the sort of template of the story of, of the garden and giving it a strong, a, a strong, I would say, sin, pride interpretation to it and applying that, viewing the King of Tyre in those terms. Um, I actually, I mean, I, I know this will, this is a Go bit speculative, it. but I think, I actually think that the tradition of God's mountain mm. being up in Lebanon, which is where Tyre is, is actually was a known tradition, both in Israel and in Phoenicia, which is mm. where Tyre is, um, because they even talk about the Bible mentions sometimes the Lebanon, which is where um, the sort of almost uh, mythic tradition of the mountain home of deity is, um, is known. Uh, it's certainly known in biblical tradition. Interestingly enough, it's also known, um, it seems to be known in um Perhaps in Ugaritic literature, it certainly is known in the story of Gilgamesh from Mesopotamia, that when Gilgamesh and his buddy Enkidu go on their adventure to go slay the, uh, the, the, uh, the monster Huwawa, also called Humbaba, um, they have to go to the Lebanon. And, hmm. and it's because Huwawa guards the mountain of the gods which is in the Lebanon, even in Mesopotamian tradition. So it's, it, it seems to be a pretty widespread tradition mm -hmm. about the mountain of the deity being in the Lebanon. Now there are other mountains where the deities are said to reside. So it's not mm 
only there. But the Lebanon seems to, it's known in Ugaritic literature, it's known in Akkadian literature, it's known in Phoenician inscription, it's known in the Bible. It seems to have been a pretty widespread tradition. And what our author seems to be doing is picking up on that tradition and running with it. Hmm. And it may be that ultimately that was the tradition, that that tradition ultimately went back to the Lebanon. But that's kind of speculative and it's not necessarily, you, right. you don't need to know that in order to read the scriptural passages um, with, um, with profit. Really, really fascinating stuff. Okay, that was... Um... I like that background there. I like that a lot. So what I would recommend everyone do is go check out your book. There's actually a lot we didn't talk about today. It's a really, really good book and interesting. Um, uh, topics we didn't expect to get into, but I'm, I'm really, uh, really thankful for that. And uh, I, think, I think people will find this really interesting interview here. So any last words before we get going here? Well, I, I don't want people... I, I don't want people to be um, um, upset in their faith by anything that I've said, that mm -hmm. I, I pursue the study of scripture ultimately to um, lift up the faith, not to, I know people say this sometimes about historical critics or feel this way about historical critics, but I would say that the majority of, of biblical scholars are actually very faithful people. And it's something that I, I, I would wish or hope that people would appreciate even when they feel as if historical critics are just tearing down their faith. Uh, I think it's possible to have a, um, a sophisticated faith. Um, mm -hmm. I think God, if God only wanted us to, to feel, then God would not have given us brains. But God's given us lots of brains in order to study the scriptures and to use our intellects to understand it as deeply and richly as possible, that we should we should we should um, read with both our heads and our hearts. Hmm. Very very much appreciated. But I uh, it's to that uh, you know the faith question and doubts or whatever and contradictions. Um, I mean, what I'd say is like there there are a lot of views on inspiration out there, and right. not all of them require uh, us to. The, think of Paul as being, you know, having some vision about what Genesis 3 was like or something like that. Uh, so, um, the, and, you know, and, and, but still saying that, you know, the text is inspired and inerrant. So uh, what I'd say is, um, you know, obviously su subscribe to the channel because uh, if we haven't talked about it already, we will be. <laughs> um, but also check out the rest of um, Dr. Smith's stuff and, um, this is this has been awesome. I really appreciate you talking to me, and sure. um, happy to do it. If if if, if people want to check out any other your resources, uh, what do you recommend? Um, I I'd say that the most accessible book that I have written is called "How Human Is God?" question mark hmm. And it's topical in some ways. Um, I'm just I probably have a book <laughs> here somewhere, but in any case. Um, and it deals with all kinds of questions which I think are challenging for uh, people who read the Bible. There's a chapter on Satan. There's a chapter um, on God's bodies. Most people don't think, well, God couldn't possibly have a body. But just tell that to Abraham when God and the two angels sit down and eat and drink under a tree. <laughs> um, so the, there are these certain sort of big questions about the way the Bible presents God and other aspects of the world and humanity and et cetera. And um, it's, it's, it's certainly the most accessible book I've written. It's the easiest to read. Um, I'd, I'd recommend people could start with that. Although someone told me Genesis of Good and Evil also reads reasonably well. So um, but in any case, that's what the, I think somebody on the back of the book said. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so I, I'd probably suggest that next. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Good stuff. I hope you have a great rest of your night. Uh, thanks Mr. very much. And thanks for having me. Of course. It's been fun. Okay.